uh, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm delighted also to share a podium with, uh, with my old friend Asher Susser. Uh, one of the things I learned when Asher and I, we used to go on the road together for Tel Aviv University. And uh, one of the things I, I learned is that he's a hard act to follow. Um, and it's not just his rhetorical style and his elegant logic, but his obvious passion. Uh, and that's because Asher is a man with a plan. Now, he's always careful to say that he isn't offering a solution, and he said that here again, uh, but it certainly is a plan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have never had a plan. Uh, I don't even have a political party. Um, I wander in that great floating Israeli center that swings elections and that's totally pragmatic, um, that changes direction when it sees some plan has gone awry, as they often do, and if the doubts of people like me can't be put to rest, no alternative plan has a future. So I have no plan to present. Instead, I have a series of questions. Uh, but together, they point in a direction, and I propose to follow them where they lead. Now, let me begin by pointing out uh, where Asher and I agree. And the amount of agreement between us is extensive. Now, for both of us, Israel is and should be a Jewish state the political expression of the Jewish right to self-determination. There's a lot of room to discuss just what that means. At a minimum, though, it means that every Jewish Israeli should see in the state of Israel some expression of his or her own understanding of what it is to be a Jew. That's what allowed uh, both communists and orthodox believers to sign Israel's Declaration of Independence in 1948. We also both value democracy as the supporting source of Israel's legitimacy. It's not why Israel should exist, but it's how Israel should exist. And finally, we both agree that directly ruling over Palestinians who aren't Israelis is a problem. Yet neither of us sees any prospect for an Israeli-Palestinian agreement which would resolve all outstanding issues in the framework of a two-state solution. But it's here that Asher and I part ways. Why? First, Asher believes that he sees where history is going, that it's to a dark place, and so we must <coughs> urgently reverse it now. I'm either humbler or less prescient than Asher. I'm not sure I see where history is going or whether the dark place isn't down precisely the road that he would follow. Now, it is possible to debate uh, endlessly the bad things that could happen if Israel remains in the West Bank, and the similarly bad things that could happen if Israel withdraws unilaterally. I call this worst case scenarioism, uh, which is usually delivered with very Jeremiah-like certainty. Now, the person who did the most in this country to popularize uh, the plan proposed by Asher was the Israeli journalist Ari Shavit. Uh, Shavit trafficked in worst case scenarios uh, in his weekly Haaretz column, this was always the last chance, the 11th hour, the decisive year. Um, a year ago in May, he warned, and I'm quoting him, time is running out. By 2025, it will no longer be possible to separate Israel from the Palestinians. Life without separation in close quarters with Hamas and the Islamic State will become untenable. In a decade's time, the international community will probably turn its back on us. And Israel will become an ostracized nation with no foreign investments and meaningful exports. Life will become miserable and bleak. The pillars that are holding up our society will disintegrate. The ongoing chaos that is laying waste to our neighbors will engulf us. Waves of terror and international sanctions may upend a nation whose identity has been shattered. And on and on and on. I can bring you a dozen verses from the prophets in the same rhetorical style. The problem with worst case scenarioism is that both sides can play it. Let me bring as an example our mutual friend, uh, Hirsch Goodman. Hirsch favors a two-state solution, uh, but thinks unilateralism will distance it uh, and bring disaster in its wake. Listen to his cascade of arguments. Without an Israeli security presence, the illicit Palestinian arms industry in the West Bank will flourish and terrorism will become legitimized and encouraged. Key strategic Israeli targets like the neighborhoods in Jerusalem or Kfar Saba and the entire center of Israel, including Ben-Gurion Airport, 
could be menaced and closed down at will by a primitive rocket. Recapturing these territories would be problematic. Israel will be perceived as leaving the battlefield in the face of adversity. This will encourage the extremists and undermine Israeli deterrence. Without Israel there to anchor Fatah's control of the PA, Hamas will soon take over. Central government will break down and chaos and factional violence will emerge impacting on Jordan and on regional stability in general and on and on. Terror, chaos, and isolation. To listen to Shavit and Goodman, Israel is damned if it does and damned if it doesn't. Now I'm going to leave this ping pong aside for now. My point is that worst case scenarioism is the worst way to approach the future because it doesn't work. Uh, on the first page of Shavit's book, he writes this sentence. As long as I can remember, I remember fear, existential fear. But that's not Israel of the generations younger than us. The, Israeli, the Israel Democracy Institute published a poll in the spring which showed that Israelis are inveterate optimists. 71% said they were optimistic or very optimistic about the future. And 81% saw Israel's ability to maintain the country's security as moderately good or good. And please note these percentages are much higher than the support, the electoral support for the right. You can't sell fear to Israelis. You can only sell hope. Which is why, and here I come to my second point, I don't think that Asher's plan will be realized. It's just not on the Israeli agenda. Israelis want peace. They'll give land for peace, and they already have. They won't give land for nothing. In 1967, Israel decided that it would never abandon Jerusalem, never return to the pre-67 lines, and never relinquish territory occupied in that war for less than peace. Those were Israel's three no's, or its red lines. Uh, they've determined everything that has happened since. Oslo and the Gaza withdrawal were only minor tweaks to that basic approach, which is still at the heart of the Israeli consensus. And since experts like Asher Susser and Hirsch Goodman are in total disagreement over the implications of land for nothing, this isn't going to change. When the public is already optimistic about the future on the basis of the present as it is, where is support for rolling the dice? Perhaps Israelis are myopic or foolish, not impossible, but it is what it is. Asher has told us that the Palestinian view is what it is and won't change anytime soon. It's a given. I agree. But I'm only extending this kind of hard-nosed analysis that Asher has done for the Palestinian reality to the Israeli one. So let me make the hard-nosed analysis of the Israeli givens. Let's start with the fact that the Israeli political order is more fragmented than ever. In each election, the leading party has fewer and fewer seats in the 120-member Knesset. Netanyahu's years in office may break Ben-Gurion's record, but Mapai, under Ben-Gurion, always had at least 40 seats in the Knesset and averaged in the mid-40s. Under Netanyahu, the Likud has averaged in the mid-20s, and the present number, 30, is a high. This handicaps governance, which is the defining feature of Israeli politics today. The bottom line is that there is no stable majority for any bold long-term strategy of Asher's sort, a strategy that would take many years to implement, he says, as long as a decade. Even if a government were somehow to start, it wouldn't last long enough to finish, as in the case of Oslo. Now, a historic leader might have been able to surmount this obstacle. We discussed leadership earlier in the day. I define a historic leader as someone with legendary credentials and a record of cutting through political knots. And you know the names, I don't have to repeat them. But for better or worse, Israel is out of them. Uh, there are many reasons, but let's call it the reversion to the norm. No nation, no matter how great, can consistently generate great leaders, as Americans know too well. Um, Israel is in an era of lesser leaders, also tainted by, by opportunism and borderline corruption. Now remember what Asher's plan involves. Israel would have to remove perhaps 80,000 settlers from their homes. These are just those who live in outside the set settlement blocks. Um, this is an order of magnitude more than were removed from Gaza. 
it is Gaza ten times over. Even over ten years, it's a Gaza withdrawal every year. Who is going to lead the nation on this perilous trek? Who will be our Moses, mentioned earlier, who will be our Moses in this desert? And have no doubt it would be perilous. Nothing has such powerful potential to divide the people as an attempt to divide the land. The last time it was tried, a prime minister was killed. It has the latent potential to kill Israeli democracy altogether, much more so than the occupation, which Israeli democracy manages somehow to take in stride. The unity of Israel is its qualitative edge, and anything that undermines it is a strategic threat. Historic political leaders had the genius to mitigate the divisions and take bold moves. Ariel Sharon was the last one able to do that. I agree with Asher. And some thought Netanyahu might. Back in 2012, Asher said at a conference here, then, and I quote him, if Netanyahu, as the head of the new government, chooses to take the centrist secular role, there is a real possibility, a real possibility that this could become policy. But more than five years have passed. Nothing of the sort has happened. Not only has Netanyahu not moved to the center, the center has moved towards him. So no, the answer is that Israel has no historic leadership. And the sudden about faces that we saw in Yitzhak Rabin and Ariel Sharon were more likely the last of their kind than a recurring phenomenon. Finally, let me add one last reason that it's not going to happen. There's something anachronistic well into this 21st century about the forced removal of tens of thousands of inhabitants from any territory. It was being done everywhere after World War II. Israel did it in 1948 to Arabs in places like Lida and Ramla. And you could forcibly settle people without asking them. Israel did it to many immigrant Jews in the 1950s. But the forced evacuation and demolition of Yamit and the Gaza settlements were, I think, the last flickers of this approach. I don't believe that a liberal Western democracy in this century still has such options. Such things might still happen in the midst of desperate wars. But in peacetime, neither Arabs nor Jews can be forced from their homes. It's just too late in history. Any future solution has to leave Israeli settlers a reasonable option of remaining where they are, and that can only be a, a, of the product of a deeper agreement. So I've told you why I believe unilateral withdrawal is a, a non-starter. Israelis, having been told for decades that the solution lies in land for peace, don't buy the supposedly superior wisdom of land for nothing. Israel's political system doesn't have the capacity to affect it anyway, and there isn't a leadership anywhere on the spectrum that's strong enough to impose it. Finally, it's out of sync with the values of the present day. We can debate it, and I'm sure we will, um, but it's a purely theoretical debate, and it's not that much different from a debate about the one-state solution. So the more interesting question is to ask what can and should be done in the real world of these givens, both Palestinian and Israeli. Today, there is a situation, let's call it the status quo, that's been remarkably durable given the winds of change that have buffeted the Middle East. Both Israelis and Palestinians continue to invest in it, maintain it, sustain it. If they didn't, it would have collapsed long ago. On the ground, the Israeli state, the Palestinian Authority, and the Hamas government all have their own political spheres. The sides of this triangle are under constant stress. We saw that again in the Temple Mount crisis over the summer. But such crisis, instead of boiling over, receded. And that has happened also time and again. If you do a Google search for the Third Intifada, you'll find that people have been predicting it for years. The fact that it hasn't happened is a testament to the residual effects of the second one and the cautious policies followed by Netanyahu and Abu Mazen. Now the question is whether this status quo can evolve further while maintaining an equilibrium. Let me say where it's not evolving. It isn't toward a one-state reality. For the one-state reality to take hold, here I agree with Asher, um, Israel would have to dismantle itself after first dismantling the authority, destroying Hamas. And this Israel will not do. So all of these spheres will continue to exist. It's not two states, but it isn't one state either. Now, you can't live with that kind of ambiguity. What are you doing in the Middle East? So how might this status quo evolve? Asher has said that after Israel withdraws, a kind of 
two-state dynamic will emerge. Let's call it an armistice. Not a peace, but a quasi-peace. In fact, an armistice has taken hold without an Israeli withdrawal. Israel cooperates in security with the Palestinian Authority. Hamas, again, just openly, recently has openly called for a long-term armistice. And not a single settler has been relocated. De facto armistice is the big picture reality. And Netanyahu didn't have the epiphany some would have liked him to have. He hasn't come up with a peace plan, but he's broken potential cycles of violence, and his approach has been, in many respects, one of live and let live. Is it ideal? Don't be absurd. But it's better than most periods in the history of Israeli-Palestinian relations. The life of a nation is a long game, and that of Israel longer than most. No single generation is charged with anticipating and solving all the problems of the future. There's a relevant story here about uh, Ben-Gurion. In 1937, he pushed for acceptance of the Peel Partition Plan uh, that would have created a minuscule Jewish state. And Golda Meir was worried. Um, what if the Jewish population, which would be swollen by refugees, would reach three million? It's far beyond the carrying capacity of the state. Uh, Ben-Gurion replied, and I quote him, what will happen after three million Jews come to this Jewish state, we shall see afterward. The future generations will take care of themselves. We must concern ourselves with this generation." End of quote. Israel is changing rapidly, growing in numbers and diversity in a globalized world in a tumultuous Middle East. Our generation took care of itself. It made mistakes, but it also left Israel stronger and at peace with important neighbors. The next generation will build on this inheritance in accord with the values we imparted, but also its own fresh reading of Israel's destiny. We never found a full solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but we created a framework for Israeli-Palestinian coexistence. Political reform, new leaders, fresh ideas. These are more likely to arise from an Israel united than an Israel divided and from the much maligned status quo.